Good afternoon, Zagreb. Good morning, Washington, D.C. Uh, it's an overwhelming feeling to be a part of this country yet to speak to you in English. Um, but after 25 years in the United States, I want to say it's a great privilege to be at a private university that is next year to celebrate 20th anniversary. We are very thrilled to have University of Libertas as our, as our uh, partner. And in that end, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Filipovic, who will welcome you all in Washington, DC, around the globe, watching us on YouTube, and all of you in the audience on behalf of the university, Professor. Uh, thank you, Sasha. Uh, uh, dear colleagues, students, friends, uh, professors, uh, welcome to the conference, Russia in the Western Balkans, Challenges to Democracy, Security, and Stability. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, as Sasha said, uh, I'm Vladimir Filipovic, Associate Professor at Libertas uh, University, and I'm here to greet you in the name of uh, Libertas University as a uh, first private and oldest, uh, oldest private university in Croatia. Uh, we are very pleased that we have chance to, uh, to host such a such interesting uh, conference with uh, which analyzes uh, uh, current and and important events. A uh, few words about our moderator today, uh, Mr. Sasha Topiric. Uh, he is uh, executive vice president of the Transatlantic uh, Leadership Network. He was a senior fellow and director of Mediterranean, Middle East, and Gulf Initiative at the Center of Transatlantic Relations at the John Hopkins University in Washington. Uh, from 2003, uh, he served as a presidential envoy from Bosnia-Herzegovina to, to the US. Dr. Topperic is a non-resident fellow at the Soran University Research Center in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan and the chairman of board at the Mediterranean Development Initiative in Tunisia. He is a featured columnist at US Military Com, a contributor to The Hill, and he has often contributed to Huffington Post and Independent Arabia. He is often a guest on Al Jazeera, Al Hura, Rudav, Kurdistan 24, and other TV stations. He has testified before the US Congress in Washington, DC, and he has edited a number of books distributed by the Brookings Institution, uh, uh, Brookings Institution Press. Uh, uh, Sasha, uh, thank you for your physical presence here in Zagreb, and uh, thank you for your red readiness to moderate uh, this conference. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yours. Thank you all. I think uh, I will uh, do a, a later on a more, uh, more uh, remarks and uh, engage with you on a conversation. There will be a Q&A session. We look forward to your questions. Uh, we hope to have a very dynamic discussion on this extremely timely uh, topic. Um, I would like briefly to introduce uh, Minister of the Foreign and uh, European Affairs of the Republic of Croatia, Minister Grilic Radman, who served also uh, with a long diplomatic career as an ambassador to Germany and Hungary. He also, at the beginning of early days of a Croatian independence, uh, facilitate opening of a several diplomatic posts in Switzerland, a long, uh, productive and successful career. Minister, hope you can hear us here at the Libertas University. We are uh, maybe a few miles away from you. Thank you for joining us. I would appreciate if you greet us with your uh, opening remarks so we can, uh, based on them, open our discussion. Thank you so much. Minister, microphone is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm really very privileged in, uh, to be on a uh, part of you or part of this in the discussion. And thank you very much and uh, for having invited me and uh, to this very important conference. And of course, good afternoon and uh, good morning uh, to Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, Although we are not, uh, we haven't met in a physical format, but however, we uh, communic communicated very well and we found a way or uh, a form of uh, communication and how to pull together. Uh, really, it's in a, uh, 
opportunity, of course, to address you on this very, very, I, I, would, I would say, the hot issue. And let me start by saying um, that Russia's interest in the Balkans, in the Western Balkans or Southeast Europe in general, and its presence and influence their date a long while back from Tsarist Russia through Soviet times to the influence of Putin's uh, Russia these days. In the past few decades, the Russian Federation slowly but surely invested in various sectors in the Balkans countries, primarily energy related, trying to make them more dependent. In addition, it um, has skillfully, skillfully carried out propaganda campaigns using pro-Russian or paid media and social networks to influence and explode the right end of the political spectrum, the nationalist, anti-globalists and traditionalists. This has been done more successfully than we like to admit. All this enabled Russia's serious impact on the internal political dynamics in the countries of the region. Serbia is a good example of this, as well as Montenegro, where we remember, remember attempts to interfere in the 2016 elections. In the current situation of Russia's unprovoked aggression on Ukraine, these concerns are greater than ever. This raises uh, questions of political and economic nature, but also of security implication for the Western Balkans. You know that Croatia fulfilled almost all their foreign policy goals, namely, we entered the NATO 2009 and the European Union 2013. Of course, we would like to uh, share our um, values, our achievements with our uh, immediate neighborhood with the, with the countries of the Western Balkans. Um, it is, of course, in our interest, not only on, uh, on the interest of the European Union, but first, first of all, uh, it's an interest to have stability, it's interest for Croatia. And we would like to prevent, uh, to some extent, possibly a uh, spillover process or a domino effect coming from, from Ukraine or from Russia. So there is, an, uh, there is no doubt that the Russian factor presents a challenge to democracy security and stability in the region, as, you, as, you, as is rightly suggested in the title of today's event. Russia has been quite our persistent competitor, competitor to both the EU and NATO, promoting an opposing set of values and rules in the region. Uh, my prime minister, and myself, we visited uh, Ukraine uh, two weeks ago, and uh, we visited uh, Kiev and, uh, and the villages, uh, Irpin and, uh, and Bucha, where was committed on hor horrific white crimes committed by Russian soldiers. Uh, we were not surprised because we had the same uh, 30 years ago when he had this great Serb aggression. And if you could imagine just what happened in Vukovar, what happened in Srebrenica and Bosnia and Herzegovina and so on. Unresolved regional issues or unfinished and disputes, fragilities and vulnerabilities, unfortunately, continue to present fertile ground for additional destabilization. We can expect Russia will try to use them as leverage to assert this, its influence. But despite Russia's increasingly assertive posture in the Western Balkans, all countries of the region state that European integration is their strategic orientation and goal. I do believe that the EU, although not the only actor in the region, is the one with the best offer. This is why we continue to advocate for EU's proactive involvement and engagement. Of course, the established criteria need to be met and the required reforms implemented. And with not shortcuts, 
despite the geopolitical circumstances. Stability should not come at the expense of democracy. They should go hand in hand. In my view, a strong dedication to enlargement by both the EU and by the Western Balkan countries is the best investment into the stability, security, and resilience of the region, as well as into our own. One could simplify things and say, EU accession can be the shield that the region really needs. So it seems that now, more than ever, the EU needs to be engaged in the Western Balkans region. This also means facilitation in solving key political issues, starting, for example, with the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina and the Belgrade Prishna dialogue. If problem, problems are left unattended, they can worsen, leading to even bigger crises that would be difficult to manage. And actors like Russia or China can use them to undermine our presence and uh, credibility. My dear colleagues, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, you are all aware, you are, you are all well aware, Moscow exerts much of its influence with Serbia, via Serbia. So EU must encourage Serbia to take its pro-EU path more coherently. And with true commitment, Serbia knows very well what is expected from them. Not to see, just to see it on one chair. It's more comfortable in comparison to, to see it on two or even more chairs. However, Serbia is on, on the way to achieve the Euro perspective and uh, therefore should also the, the follow their common uh, foreign and security policy. We had recently on the Foreign Affairs Council in Brussels meeting with our ministers from the Western Balkans, and we openly said that what we are expecting from the from the from the countries, from the region, from the Western Balkans, when they want to be in a part of the European Union. Alarms have already been raised that Russia's occupation of Ukraine could jeopardize Kosovo security, especially in the north where the full scope of sovereignty is lacking. This is why we need to start considering EU's position on the status of Kosovo. Uh, Croatia is strongest supporter of uh, visa liberalization of Kosovo. Its recognition by all EU and NATO members should not remain a taboo. I mentioned so, and uh, really, and uh, we are vocal proponent of Kosovo independency to be uh, recognized among the other European countries. There, there, are, there remains five countries in the European Union to not recognize independence and sovereignty of uh, Kosovo. And as I mentioned, Kosovo cit citizens should be granted visa-free regime to you as this overdue issue has been unaddressed for too long. I look forward also to, to having your support. However, although you are not politicians, but you have also to have an influence on the politicians in your uh, respective countries. And Bosnia and Herzegovina, of course, what I forgotten to mention that uh, the negotiations uh, Accession negotiation with North Macedonia, North Macedonia and Albania should start as soon as possible. Bosnia and Herzegovina is certainly one of the most fragile countries in the Western Balkans, and Russia's worrying efforts continue. Political divisions in Bosnia and Herzegovina have almost never been this deep. There is no basic understanding nor a common vision on the future of the country. Consensus on the European integration seem to be declarative, uh, declarative at, at best, and there is in the practically no progress in European integration. That is why Croatia has worked relentlessly to promote a fair and swift electoral reform, a comprehensive electoral and constitutional reform, as the cornerstone of the country's normal democratic functioning and 
political stability. Um, namely, the current electoral framework is in a breach of the European Convention on Human Rights and has serious con constitutional gaps. The reform electoral law should ensure the equality of all the three constituent peoples and other citizens. Um, and of course, as well as the equality of all its citizens. This is crucial for the country's sustainable stability. Who more than Croatia is interested uh, uh, in having uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina in not only in the European Union, but also in the in the NATO. Investing additional political and diplomatic efforts to secure a fair electoral process would be a wise approach. Otherwise, we could and up dealing with a political crisis after the elections too. In the neighboring Montenegro, EU should also support the EU-related reforms and encourage the new government to overcome the current stagnation. They clearly stated its pro-EU path. Once they deliver, we must be ready to promptly answer according, accordingly. And going back, back but uh, I would like to stress once more, uh, something that feels like the first step we are, we are, as the EU should take if we want to assure our credibility in the region, as I mentioned, it's in Albania, North Macedonia, North Macedonia. It is of utmost importance, once again, to start accession negotiation with these two countries without any further delay. And just to sum up, we have to be aware of Russia's influence, first of all, and should use all tools in our toolbox to counter it. We are, as a democratic states, we are as a rules-based international order, democracy, European values. Whether it's, it is in energy, media, or other areas, Russia's influence is possible not only because of its strengths, but also because of our own past failure and weaknesses in the region. So the EU, as well as NATO, has to focus more on its own actions to increase our credibility and leverage in the region, make our political presence and engagement more immediate. And speaking on the NATO, we, we just uh, we welcome the two countries, even more countries as uh, members, allies, namely Sweden and, uh, and, and Finland. And Croatia is, we, str strongly, uh, we strongly support uh, uh, their accession to the, to the NATO. It is additional uh, contribution and added value uh, having these countries in our club. And of course, we will protect them if necessary. We need to be there for them, helping them build democratic, uh, democratic and more resilient societies is the best approach in countering malign influence. Let me conclude by inverting the logic a little bit. This crisis, no matter, matter how difficult, surely presents an opportunity and we must seize it, seize it to firmly bond the Western Balkans countries to the EU. Croatia awaits them, and not only them, with friendly, open arms, ready to help. Thank you very much. Sir, thank you very much for uh, your uh, uh, valuable and inspiring remarks. Uh, you touched really upon all the key issues we are going to discuss today. I would like to... Uh, say that a testament of a great relationship between the United States and Croatia perhaps was crowned recently where the United States accepted free visa regime for the Croatian citizens to visit the United States. And uh, God bless Croatia, God bless this strengthened um, partnership uh, transatlantic to which you are a leading example for the Western Balkan region. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, if you have to go, we'll send you the video and the proceedings from this uh, conference and our future events. Thank you so much for being with us again. Thank you. And Thank you, I wish you all the best. Yes, I have to leave. Thank you, Minister. God bless. All the best. So now we'll, we'll, we'll start first with our um, speaker, guest from Montenegro, who published a book 
on Russian policies in the Western Balkans. Uh, I was uh, happy to uh, meet uh, Nebojša at the Johns Hopkins when he came to be with us at SAIS for several months uh, where he extensively researched this back then, we're talking several years ago, extremely timely um, topic. Nebojša has uh, been advisor to the Minister of Education and Science. He was an assistant minister to the Education of Public and Welfare Services in Montenegro. He was an assistant minister of Ministry of Health, one of the founders of an NGO, Pan-European Union. So for all you students here, when you do need to do moderate the panel, you need to learn the biographies at least key points. Uh, so to honor people who uh, you uh, introduced. Nebojša, great to uh, have you in the studio. Then we'll uh, join with our great lineup from experts in uh, Washington, uh, D.C. Each of them, which I will announce and introduce as they come, are um, very, very esteemed experts in their own rights and extremely involved in what is happening today in the Ukraine and Russia. I think we'll have a very dynamic discussion. Last point before... I turn to Nebojša. If you think of posing a question, which I encourage you to do so, please introduce yourself. And uh, there are no political statements of how long you can make a statement, 30 seconds, but then have a clear question that we can then uh, share to the audience. Nebojša, microphone yours. I would like to welcome all of you today. Uh, Minister Gerlich, uh, His Excellency Minister Gerlic Radman, Dr. Popovic, and uh, especially our esteemed uh, guest from the USA, Ms. Kega, Ms. Senova, and Ms. Herbst. Uh, Dr. Popovic, thank you for your introduction. You placed me in a good position to, um, to uh, explain what I've written, uh, what I've written uh, in my book, uh, Politics of Russia, of, the, uh, of Russia in the Western Balkan, and not just uh, about that, to give my opinion in uh, general. Uh, maybe you remember our panel in uh, Washington, D.C., where, where I explained uh, at John Hopkins University, where I explained uh, uh, this relationship between uh, Mon between uh, Western Balkan country and Russia with a sentence, there is no brotherly love, there, there is just brotherly interest. Uh, that sentence, that uh, uh, proof of the sentence we got today, um, not just in, not just for Montenegro, but also in Serb, but also with Serbia and all uh, Western Balkan Western Balkan countries. Um, uh, you probably recently heard about uh, Putin's statement uh, about Kosovo. In that statement, he put uh, uh, Kosovo and Obas and Obas in, in equal position. So, uh, so doing by <clears throat> uh, uh, recognize Kosovo as an independent country. That's all Russian national interest right now. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, for uh, I'm sure that that if Vucic had uh, ever wanted to recognize Kosovo as independent, what is not possible for any Serbian politicians, it's uh, it's uh, would be would uh, have been allowed by by Rus by Russia until now. Now uh, Putin, who is a, a old KGB school. Uh, for Putin, who is all KGB school, is more important to keep uh, Balkan unstable and uh, to play his egoistic role, trouble, trouble solver. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there are uh, there are factors of influence uh, of Russia in the Western Balkans. I call them uh, pillars of Russian of uh, Russian foreign policy in the Western Balkans. Uh, he, uh, history, uh, geography, economy, uh, 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 religion, and um, are described in my uh, uh, within my book, and uh, I will focus today just on two: history and uh, uh, history and religion. Uh, all historical evidence uh, uh, give uh, give us the same uh, as, as same picture um, that Russia. Um, in the case of Montenegro, use Montenegro 
struggle for independence uh, for their national interests. Namely, Montenegro uh, was the edge on uh, uh, Ottoman Empire. Uh, so uh, anytime when needed, uh, Montenegro people uprose against uh, against the uh, Ottoman Empire on Russia request. For that services, uh, uh, Russia financed uh, Montenegro, but that always represented as a, uh, as a assistant to Montenegro and um, benefit just for, for one side, for Montenegro side. Uh, curiously, uh, uh, anytime when Montenegro ruler uh, uh, turned to the West, uh, he uh, proclaimed uh, to be traitor, and in some cases, uh, his life uh, was in jeopardy. Um, uh, uh, nowadays, uh, religion is a uh, religion is a main pillar of Russian foreign policy in the Western in the Western Balkan, and uh, 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 their uh, strategic thinkers uh, realized that. Uh, that pan-Slavism or, or Russian world is not uh, is not enough to cover all sphere of, of influence, and they decide to use uh, to use uh, uh, or religion or, or actually Orthodox Church. Uh, they uh, they spread uh, uh, they spread the pseudo theory about ontological supremacy, uh, Orthodox Church in comparison with the Catholic Church and other churches and a Russian, uh, Russian messiah, uh, role as a messiah who will protect, uh, uh, protect all the Orthodox world from the de uh, decadent West. Uh, this kind, maybe someone in uh, Montenegro, Serbia and uh, in Bosnia will be angry, but I can say that is, uh, this is some kind of uh, orthodox fundamentalism who will produce uh, orthodox, uh, orthodox state, uh, uh, orthodox state in cooperation with the wealthy uh, multi-ethnic uh, state, uh, uh, Western, Western countries. Um, uh, according to their claim, uh, orthodox church and state uh, um, are in uh, some kind of symphony, but that is not true. That uh, that is not uh, real because uh, uh, Orthodox Ch Orthodox Church is uh, subjugated by the ruler. The ruler in Orthodox world is not just the ruler; uh, he is a cosmocrator. Uh, but in Putin case, uh, he is undergoing process of apotheosis uh, because that means that all his decisions are divinely accurate and um, um, he has a plan for everything and um, uh, uh, there is no there is no doubts for any decision of Putin. Um, uh, 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 I will just uh, I said uh, uh, I just I just I previously uh, said that I would that I would focus on just two pillars uh, uh, religion and uh, uh, history but one more is uh, is uh, also important as uh, uh, those two uh, that's economy uh, we have so many examples about uh, that the, why is economy so important for Russia in this region. Uh, um, uh, everyone knows that uh, that uh, Western countries uh, depends on Russian gas. Uh, um, Russian support for Kosovo uh, uh, for Kosovo was uh, uh, was conditioned by uh, by sale uh, Serbian oil industry to uh, to uh, to uh, to, uh, to Gazprom. Um, on the other hand, in Mont uh, Montenegro, uh, depends touristic season depends of Russian tourists. Uh, Twenty-five percent of all tourists in Montenegro in Montenegro season are Russians. Um, um, and one more thing, uh, and one more thing is that uh, first investments following Montenegro independence was Russian investment in uh, uh, fab fabric of uh, aluminum in Podgorica, 
uh, that investment, that controversies and consequences of that investment uh, no, uh, uh, have been pl plaguing Montenegro uh, to this day. I know right now thoughts of uh, Dr. Toprich. He will ask me, yes, that's okay, Nevusha, but you have to tell me the solutions. Uh, the solutions that we need to prevent uh, uh, prevent uh, role of Orthodox Church uh, with, uh, in society of um, society and governments in uh, Western country, Western Western, Western Balkan countries. Um, also, um, also we need to uh, we need to uh, to educate uh, society about Russian malign media uh, malign media influence uh, um, documents report and uh, and uh, publicize this uh, publicize this the uh, that western balkans countries need to find an alternative for 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 russian gains and uh, in the end uh, us has to take a bigger role in this uh, in this region um, uh, obviously that EU, eu is not uh, uh, is not unique to solve all pro all troubles in uh, and issues in this region. So, uh, uh, because of that, uh, U.S. Uh, U.S. role has to be uh, bigger. Uh, Bosnia, uh, Bosnia, uh, Bosnia, especially in Bosnia and Kosovo, and uh, as soon as possible, Bosnia must to start with the uh, process of NATO. A NATO accession. In that way, in that way, Bosnia. In that way, Serbia is a main player is, uh, for Russia. Main player of Russia in Western Balkan will be surrounded uh, by the, the uh, by the NATO member countries. Thank you very much. This is. Thank you, Nebesha. Before we, um, you touched some uh, uh, interesting and important uh, point. Before I. Uh, I give to uh, Margarita, uh, who actually won a John Knight's um, Journalist Fellowship Award at Stanford on reporting on our nationalism in the Balkans, and she's a real expert on our energy and the security um, in the Central Asia and, uh, and um, uh, Balkans. Uh, energy is one of the key issues. Uh, it's a key issue that we speak uh, about Russia for a decade. Uh, the US has always recently advocated the energy diversification, energy security. Um, I'm sure that uh, our distinguished fellow, uh, energy fellow Deborah will address uh, plenty of those uh, points. The recent European Commission stress suggested that 60% of uh, Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, North Macedonia energy needs if it's prolonged, 60% would be reduced. This is a serious issue. And I don't know how much uh, in uh, Europe and uh, Washington are looking deep into this because everybody is now looking into what will happen uh, with the German economy and Europeans economies if uh, Europe indeed come to a decision to um, stop importing um, oil from, uh, from Russia. But I think I want before Margarita, and I want to put my stamp on it, um, myself being uh, from this region. There are some analysts who suggest that the Russia is a military threat, that the Russia it will tilt the balance of power and the security is going to be undermined. Look, Nebuchadnezzar comes from Montenegro in October 2016. Uh, Russian certain state elements tried to organize a coup to prevent uh, Montenegro from joining NATO. They were supportive of uh, North Macedonian uh, Gruevski government. They accused the progressive uh, Prime Minister Zaev of being a uh, foreign spy to the Western intelligence. But what's the outcome? Both Montenegro and North Macedonia are the member of NATO. Now think of it. What can Montenegro endanger militarily Russia? What can, what danger can Russia feel from any country in the Western Balkan being part of the NATO? And my argument is that the NATO being much more 
these days than a military alliance. It's an alliance that supports reforms. It's an alliance that supports rule of law. It's an alliance that supports democratic building in a countries, even within the Europe itself, where we can argue we should preserve those values. Unlike in the Western Balkans, that those values are yet to be um, developed. So I think that Putin, first and foremost, reason for keeping, as Nebojša suggested, Balkans destabilized, not only to be to have a seat on a table, but to keep it destabilized. Because if you do build a vibrant economy, vibrant democracy, if you do really build independent judiciary that will protect your investments, that you know as an investor and as a citizen that your rights will be defended. That's the failure and defeat of autocracy to which the minister alluded from Tsar's time in his speech. We have to recognize Russia had not known the true freedom of a speech, freedom of an expression, freedom of an opinion, and the democratic values. I think this is the key battle that we are uh, facing with Russia. And I think what the minister also alluded, and then Margarita, I'll stop here. I'll give it this uh, punch of, of, a, of, of a thought to you, back to you on human rights issue. And I will address really a uh, issue in Bosnia and Herzegovina that I'm, I'm born in. 2009, European Court of Human Rights passed the verdict about, called Say the Trinity, as all of you know, that the minorities and so-called others by the Constitution or Dayton Peace Accord are discriminated. 2009, we are in 2022. 2016, Ljubic passed, Ljubic verdict was passed by the Constitutional Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina in respect to the Croatian representations and discrimination of the constituency. In 2018, Pilav Zornic, the citizens who simply wanted to run as the citizens of the country without any ethnic affiliation, were also proved to be discriminated. Now, local politicians here have the same rhetoric for 25 years. The, 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 no one genuinely tackled the complexity of these issues. Why? Because everybody has their own pockets of power. And this is exactly what plays into the Putin. So I want to tell everyone in, 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 this, in Bosnia and Herzegovina and then further down south when it comes to the human rights, all the Russian influence to which you want to uh, so uh, eloquently talk, uh, mostly to accuse your political opponents and those that disagree with your opinion, are a reflection of all your lack of progress in the reforms that you are supposed to engage. And this complex Bosnia-Herzegovina, for example, is in a sense to guarantee citizens' rights, constituency rights, and minorities' rights. This should not be addressed as a political work, but of international experts and those of not constitutional law, but of the electoral law. With the lessons learned from around the world of an independent people who can look and produce a model that will stop the brain drain. That is the second problem to these nations. All these are playing into the Putin's hands. So Margarita, now to you, you're a uh, I don't know if you want to take this route or, to, or, or, or address to the energy issues or 
but I think it's it's I think it's important to mention that the, the, the political scheme from coming from the political elite here actually is uh, a, a big issue. The lack of progress in the reforms is a key issue that could deflect Russia malign and shade the investment influence that happened and purchases, which some of them are really questionable and all what uh, Neboisha and others are talking. Margarita. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me today. I absolutely agree with you. Bosnia needs a very significant reform to address all these issues and any deficiency of democracy is helping uh, dictators such as uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, it is creating openings for strategic corruption. It is uh, opening uh, the local businesses to dependency on, uh, on Russian influence and small Russian payments that are buying huge influence of, of Moscow in the Balkans. But we have a much bigger problem with Bosnia. I think we need a revision of the Dayton Agreement and change of the Constitution with all that comes with it in ele um, electoral rights and human rights and political rights uh, to be defended in a better way and to get away from this uh, ethnic representation and ethnic balance that is becoming an impediment instead of, uh, as in the beginning, it was helping to to solidify peace in, in the Balkans. It's been many years since Dayton. It's going to be, um, it's, it's time, it's been a long time to reform it. And I think we have a momentum now with the, uh, that is coming from every catastrophe, every bad event in the world. There are always challenges, very big challenges, but there are also opportunities. The weakening of Russia may actually be that opportunity to allow for uh, significant changes in the Balkans. The consolidation of the European Union and NATO countries, the building of will to address weak points in the European continent could be another benefit from what is happening in Ukraine, which is a, a terrible war with, uh, with the same and even worse uh, sometimes crimes against humanity committed by Russian forces. But let me start with something else. First, in order to understand what Russia is up to in the Balkans, we need to go to the basics. What are Russia's goals? It is strategic domination and imperial expansion. And as the Minister of Croatia for Foreign Affairs said, these goals have not changed since Ekaterina the Great. The primary objective of Moscow's foreign policy has been to restore Russia as a major center or pole of power in a multipolar polar multi-centric world and to be a central power in Europe and Eurasia. So Russia is Russia a spoiler in the Balkans, as some scholars claim. I would say um, it is a really wrong concept. To mean it minimizes Russia's strategic subversion of the region. It um, undermines um, it uh, undermines the Balkan states' ability to join Western institutions. But this is just only one tool in Moscow's basket of subversion. And uh, Janusz Bogaiski and I counted in our book six years ago that there were more than 68 different tools in that basket, in that um, arsenal of subversion that are being implemented selectively in different countries, depending on, on the local circumstances. They involve international institutions, diplomatic means, military um, uh, uh, means uh, energy, uh, economic means, uh, penetration of the church, of local organizations, nonprofit organizations, the media, and so on. So, uh, and they are using them really very, very selectively. They've used them in Ukraine before the war. They use them in the Balkans uh, in a different way in different countries. Um, uh, but one very important thing to note here is we have four rival powers in the Balkans, the United States, the European Union, Russia and China. But Russia is the only external actor with a clear imperial agenda. And this is why it should not be treated as a normal competitor, especially after the war in Ukraine. It is not a conventional rival. It is an adversary power and it's adversary to the West and it's adversary to the Balkans. So what are the main areas, as the speakers before me uh, outlined, the main areas uh, through which uh, Russia has achieved a significant political sway in the Western Balkans? Um, by investing in four strategic areas, energy, 
defense, the media, and the Orthodox Church. These investments are in select countries such as Serbia, the Serb entity of Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Montenegro, in North Macedonia, but very importantly, they are not significant monetary expenditures. They are not significant investments by all means. In fact, Russia makes money in the Balkans from selling energy and weapons uh, from getting the local governments to pay for its mega pipeline projects, uh, from acquiring controlling interest in national energy companies such as uh, Nefta Industria Srpska in Serbia or through them controlling a number of gasoline stations and uh, gas storage facilities such as Banatski Dvor and so on. This is um, a, a way of Russia, on the one hand, spreading political influence, on the other hand, making money to support um, to support its war in Ukraine, or support the war in Syria, or to support other uh, other adventures that are causing suffering. As somebody, as, uh, as speakers before me mentioned, the media influence is really huge, significant in the Balkans, particularly among the Serbian population. It comes from the outlets of Sputnik and Russia Today, a television channel. And I have to say here, Sputnik is being um, broadcast, he has been uh, broadcast in Serbian and he has been present in uh, online in Serbian and many outlets throughout the Balkans are just copying these news items and putting them as their own on their own website so the readers don't even have an idea that this is actually coming from a Russian source and Russian outlet. Um, Sputnik has contracts with about 20 different radio stations around Serbia that are putting their news items as number one um, on their news uh, broadcasts and, and they are broadcasting them as their own news. And this is very, very seriously underestimated danger to the Balkans that is affecting the Serbian population in Serbia and Republika Srpska, in North Kosovo, uh, in Bosnia, you name it. Anywhere where Serbian population lives or population that speaks Serb the Serbian language uh, or understands the Serbian language. This is, uh, on, the, on the other hand, that uh, uh, these outlets, the Russian outlets, uh, probably not, uh, not uh, that much um, needed by, by the Serbian authorities because they have their own, um, uh, uh, they have their own uh, controlled, uh, government controlled media outlets, uh, the tabloids in particular. So they're pushing their message through the tabloids. The Russian media is emphasizing the same, the same um, message and it's becoming a symbiosis between the two. Um, it is uh, pretty helpful to them. So what can we do uh, in order to, uh, to uh, curb that influence? On the energy sphere, um, the Balkans never thought, the countries in the Western Balkans never took seriously energy diversification other than Croatia by building the LNG regasification terminal in Kirk. Um, and Albania um, that is going to get gas from uh, Azerbaijan. Um, we don't see uh, more effort in other countries to diversify energy supply. It's true, Croatia can, uh, uh, Bosnia is isolated. It's not on the seaside. It can, cannot have an LNG terminal. It's very much locked into Balkans. Um, uh, so it's, it's difficult to get gas from other sources, but I think that uh, the Ionic Adriatic pipeline from Albania all the way up through Montenegro and Croatia needs to be a first priority for the Balkans. Azerbaijan is going to start producing more gas and sending more gas to Europe and that gas is going to go to the Balkans. Uh, and it's going to happen very, very soon, faster than it was planned initially, precisely because of the war in, in Ukraine. So that's one way. Expansion of the LNG facility in Croatia is another way. Um, have in mind, and we have to have in mind that, the Bosnian economy uses very little gas. Macedonia uses very little gas. These are not a huge gas consuming countries. Gas is a, a very a small portion of the energy mix. These countries actually have to do a lot more work to diversify away from coal um, then, then, you know, just uh, that may lead to expansion of uh, gas consumption. But in any event, uh, these are small percentages and the Balkans are uh, buying from Russia 
altogether about 10 BCM of gas, and I'm talking here from Romania to Bulgaria, Greece, all the way to all the Balkan countries, including Slovenia. I will put all of them uh, in one basket. I know that some of them don't want to be called Bal Balkan countries, but looking at the peninsula, if you look from Slovenia all the way to Greece and, and Albania and Romania, it's a uh, less than 10 BCM of Russian gas. This is very, very small volume that could be replaced by other sources. Um, connection between Macedonia and the transatlantic pipeline is going to deliver enough gas for Macedonia and, uh, and connect even Kosovo in the future. Bulgaria is getting already a little bit of gas from um, from uh, Azerbaijan and getting some from LNG sources because Russia suspended gas deliveries to Bulgaria and Poland. It can be done, uh, but it takes determination. It takes money because that pipeline has to be built and takes the commitment of the European Union to do so. In terms of defense penetration, Serbia is spending so much on defense, more than any NATO country. It's spending more, I mean, um, in Europe, more than 2% on defense. Why is Serbia arming itself so intensely with Russian weapons? Why is Serbia buying tanks? What is, what is Serbia planning to do with this military equipment and this push to, to build a mighty army? Um, this must be addressed, and here is the place of the European Union to really um, uh, have it very clear to Serbia. Serbia has these four pillar um, uh, foreign policy, uh, the four pillars of diplomacy that was developed years ago by President Tad uh, Tadic, but this is now happening. What is now happening is those pillars are colliding and the one that Serbia relies on is collapsing. Russia is collapsing and we're not talking enough what is going to happen after the war. Uh, but it's very important for the Balkan region as one of the regions of strategic inter interest to Russia to think in two directions. On the one hand, Russia itself may collapse. It's a failed state. And sooner or later it will collapse. And this war is going to only help the process speed up and uh, lead to Russia's rupture or even fragmentation. Uh, but before Russia is weak enough not to be a danger to anyone, it can still incite damage to the neighboring regions. It can incite conflicts in the Balkans, in the Caucasus, in Central Asia. Um, it can stir uh, trouble in other areas that we need to be prepared for. And deciding uh, solving the Kosovo Serbia, uh, the recognition of Kosovo by, by Serbia and other European countries should be number one on the agenda because this is the easiest way to start a new conflict in the Balkans, inside the Serbs, um, uh, stir trouble. And they, we almost had a military mobilization last year along the border with Kosovo, between Serbia and Kosovo, because of a um, vehicle uh, registration plates. Can you imagine what can be done with a little bit more effort to incite such a conflict? But the second thing is, the collapsing of, with Russia, as it's going to probably endanger neighboring countries and regions of strategic interest to Russia, is also going to provide a lot of opportunities for us to solve a lot of problems together, both the Balkan states, European Union, and the United States, to work together to help the countries that need to reform their systems, reform quicker, become members of the European Union and NATO, those who want a uh, quicker and uh, solve this gap that is still existing on the European continent that needs to be addressed as soon as possible. Thank you. Oh, Margarita, thank you so much. You've uh, touched so many things there. I think uh, we will uh, already elevate the discussions to the uh, entire European and geopolitics with the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, I, I don't know personally with these, such an advanced weaponry and uh, including hypersonic missiles and, and, and uh, ballistic missiles. And uh, one of the questions that I would anyway have to for all of you is uh, what would be the preferred end game? I think we, we've, we have to, uh, I think it's a, everybody is anxious. Uh, and I would say particularly peripheral people in the Western Balkans because they've been through this in the, in the 90s. Some young students here may not uh, remember uh, what minister mentioned in Vukovar and the genocide in Srebrenica and 
apart from those a millions of people displaced and, and, and lives turned ups and down, uh, always easier to destroy and so much more difficult to rebuild. So uh, Ambassador uh, Herbs, I'm, uh, okay, we have an icon here with us, uh, over 30 years of, um, of experience, uh, an ambassador, US ambassador to Ukraine, the US ambassador to Uzbekistan, Consul General in uh, Jerusalem, served in uh, embassies in Tel Aviv, in Moscow, in Saudi Arabia, as a Presidential Distinguished Medal of Honor and the State Department uh, Medal of Honor. And if you watch CNN and other news, you can see uh, Ambassador Herbst uh, so very often these days. Ambassador, he's a currently a Senior Director at the uh, Atlantic Council uh, Eurasia Center. Ambassador, good to have you with us, uh, floor is yours. And then Deborah, and okay. then we'll open into the discussion and questions. Thank, Thank you. you. So I don't do something you don't want me to do. Would you like me to talk about Ukraine and the Western Balkans or Ukraine, excuse me, Russia and the Western Balkans or Russia, Ukraine, and how that relates to the West, Western Balkans? Your choice, Ambassador. My choice. All right, I'll speak very briefly about Russia, Ukraine, and then flip to the main subject for this conference. Uh, I agree with Margarita that Putin is losing and he could never have won in Ukraine. Um, he's done worse than I expected, but I never expected him to win. And I think we're seeing that right now. And while I'm not gonna predict the fall of the Putin regime or the collapse of Russia, I would say the fall of the Putin regime is significantly more likely than a Russian victory. Uh, there's a long history in Russia of leaders pursuing harebrained schemes and losing power as a result, or at a minimum, uh, introducing significant reform once the failure of that harebrained scheme becomes apparent. And it's happened half a dozen times, or almost half a dozen times. Uh, I think that the principal factor on the speed with which the war in Ukraine ends is the uh, wisdom and strength of the West. If the United States, but also our allies, is more um, energetic and less fearful in providing what Ukraine needs to win, um, this will happen, the, the victory will come sooner rather than later. Uh, Deborah and I, but Deborah even more, have been very much involved in trying to encourage Washington to send those weapons they still send to refuse to send, whether they are quote unquote long range fires or planes, be they MiGs or Suhoi's, and beyond that, Western style fighters and bombers. Uh, but this war will not end until Putin realizes he cannot win. And that comes faster again with a stronger Western response. The positive thing I'll say here is, A, uh, while they, they work in one two step forwards, one step backward fashion, the Biden administration is moving in the right direction. The $40 billion aid package is a sign of that. Although there's growing criticism of it, especially on the right, which we need to watch. I don't think it will get in the way of it, but it might. And in the long run, that could be the a sign of some further developments politically, which could be make it harder for us to sustain support for Ukraine. I don't think that'll pan out that way, but you can't be certain. Okay, Russia and the Western Balkans. I think my hawkish bona fides on Russia and on Russian Ukraine are pretty well known. Um, I'm not certain though, that those that same approach that we have on Russia and Ukraine is what we need for Russia and the Balkan states. Because while Russian activities there are malign, they are very different than the flat out conventional war that they are waging in Ukraine. So my, my recommendations are, I think, rather similar to what Margarita said and what your report said. Um, but first, um, it's clear that from the standpoint of stopping Moscow's aggression in Ukraine, Serbia and Bosnia have not been helpful. I don't think we should worry about that. I don't think it's important. Uh, we might call them on it, um, but not, we should not spend too much time working that. That's a tertiary issue. Uh, and I agree that the, the most important thing we need to do 
is encourage the emergence of strong societies, democratic societies, rule of law societies throughout the Balkans. And the best way to do that um, is to make it more likely uh, faster that they can enter the European Union. And among the good things that have happened as a result of Putin's massive invasion of Ukraine three months ago is that on this issue too, some of our, I would say, less than strong-minded European allies, particularly in Paris and Berlin, are talking about expediting uh, entry for the Western Balkan states who are not part of the EU into that institution, right? And I think there's going to be a summit next month to talk about this. So that's a good sign, and we, the United States, should, should support that. And of course, while we don't have to worry about arming uh, our friends in the Balkan states because the Russians are about to invade, there are a whole host of things we can be doing which falls into the hybrid warfare area that we should do more of. And, and again, Margarita, talked, I think, touched on virtually everything. Uh, that starts with, of course, pro, you know, promoting the rule of law, but it also means being more active in the disinformation sphere. Uh, we, have to, we have to be much more active in that area, in the West Balkans as in everywhere. And I think, I think, I think there's actually a pretty good misinformation or disinformation uh, effort going on as relates to Russia and Ukraine not so much as it relates to Russia and the Western Balkans. We need to be atten paying attention to those other areas where Moscow is active in ways that undermine our interests. So our intelligence services can up their game in the Western Balkans. So we're keeping very close attention on Moscow's efforts to promote its influence via blackmail, bribery, um, and other things. And uh, we had to pay special attention to the Moscow Patriarchy. Uh, in my personal life, uh, I, I was a member, I was, am a member of the Russian Orthodox Church abroad, but that part of the church that did not go onto union with the Moscow Patriarchy. But at the big um, uh, conference to talk about union with Moscow, they brought in the leadership of my old church, brought in a senior, an archbishop from Serbia, who's making the case about how peachy the MP in Moscow were. So I've seen them, the activities of the MP and their, you might say their Balkan affiliates up close and personal. And we know the role they play throughout the region in pursuing the interests of the Kremlin. Particularly evident in the statements made by Patriarch Kirill in support of Moscow's war of, of uh, war of war crimes in Ukraine. I don't know if that's, if we can highlight that in ways that could undermine the MP position in the Balkans. But if we can, we should. So that's, that's how I, I look at this situation. I think the situation in the Western Balkans is on balance favorable. It, there are dangers. The whole you know, Bosnian thing is, is dangerous. Uh, excuse me, Bosnia and also the, the relationship between Serbia and Kosovo, but dangerous within certain limits. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, you have a last world and then we'll open a debate. Thank you. And um, I'm really greatly appreciative of all of the, um, the speakers here today and what they've had to say. And I thought, and I want uh, especially to thank the uh, minister for his comments and talking about the values that EU membership would bring on these countries. And, and that's what I really want to talk about here is, um, you know, democracies that are new are fragile. And, and I would argue that the EU has not done such a great job at making certain that new democracies that it has given, uh, with, that has accorded membership to these countries, that the EU has sort of fallen down on the job in ensuring that those democracies actually stay as democracies. Um, I'm not gonna get into a long debate about this, but I'll just point out to Orban's Hungary on this. And I think it's important to say that although bringing countries into the EU is critical, the EU has to do a far better job on ensuring that its extant members continue to embrace and endorse democratic values. And, and I think 
a lot of what has gone on in Orban's Hungary over the last uh, several years was pushed underneath the carpet that it affected energy issues. For example, the long-term nuclear energy contract that uh, Hungary signed with Russia, where apparently bags of money went to Orban personally to do this. And the EU remained largely silent while this was going on. And so if we're going to move forward <clears throat> with democratic values and talk about that stability that those values give to these countries, that the EU has to do a better job of holding its members' feet to the proverbial fire to make certain that there isn't this backsliding of new democracies. Um, democracy is fragile. Uh, it's been fragile in the United States for some people, as Ambassador Herb said, on the right, but also on the left, who would rather do away with some of our democratic values. We've seen a lot of this in the last two to three years. And it's even more fragile in places where democracy is relatively new. So the Balkans are a prime example of don't just assume that if you join the EU, that that means that you're going to have stability and magical things happen overnight to change the dynamics of the problems and difficulties of these countries. And I look at my colleague, <clears throat> uh, Margarita, who's from Bulgaria, and she knows firsthand some of the issues that have happened in that country as well. So I, I point to the fragility of democracies and to not assume that just joining an institution will automatically change the dynamic of those countries. I want to get to, uh, to Russia here briefly. Um, I heartily endorse uh, Nebuchadnezzar's comments, Margarita's comments, Ambassador Herbst's comments on this, and, and Dr. Toporich's comments on this, as well as the ministers. Um, Russia will, sees a vacuum and it's going to fill it. <laughs> the Balkans are no, uh, they're, they're, they're not deprived of that. Uh, we see this in the Middle East when the United States made a decision to not be as active in the Middle East and Russia moved into Syria in a large way. And the support for the Assad government, Iran's ability to destroy Lebanon never could have occurred without substantial Russian help and assistance. And so when the West makes a decision to walk away from someplace, a malign actor is going to fill that void. And that is true in the Balkans as well. Uh, and and as, as so many of you put it today about it's maybe time to have a relook at Dayton, part of that relook should include why are you opening doors for other actors to make decisions on the future of these nations? And, and I think that's an important point. I want to get to energy here briefly. One of the reasons why Russia was able to prosecute this war against humanity is because Russia was earning almost 50% of its GDP from the sale of fossil fuels and fossil fuel byproducts to the rest of the world, and a huge amount of it to the West. Uh, not just to the, to the Balkans, but to a huge part of Western Europe. In effect, the West was underwriting Russia's ability to be the horrible actor we all knew it was going to be and has now proven every single day in Ukraine. And, and this alternative of looking, at, uh, of looking at alternatives to Russian gas and oil and other petroleum byproducts um, is too long in coming. And it's horrible that the Ukrainian people have had to suffer the slaughter to show the rest of the West how horribly mistaken they were going down this path. So uh, there's been some recent new signing of agreements between Bulgaria and Albania. The, it, there is the new pipeline conduct, uh, connector that's going to go from um, Greece, uh, which will help. But Turk Stream, unlike Nord Stream, uh, except for the Bulgarian cutoff, is still vibrantly flowing there. Um, Turkey still gets 40% of its gas from Russia. Um, that pipeline that goes into Serbia and supports Serbia goes right into Hungary. And so the question is now, what are these countries going to do about this? 
Uh, are you just going to take a hands-off view on this and say, let the Russian, let the Russian gas flow? We're not going to interfere with it because it's on your territory that this is being allowed to uh, to continue. Um, finally, on on the uh, military side, um, I think the buildup uh, with Russian substantial help in Serbia does not bode well. Um, it's not only illogical, as Margarita said, for Russia, it's very logical. It's another way to draw a line, to cause trouble, and to threaten other countries in the Western Balkans with a, a Russian proxy, which is Serbia. And I think it needs to be spoken out about. We shouldn't just have to hear it in conferences like this, but it is appalling to me that both the EU and NATO are not looking at this. We should not be institutions that can only deal with one crisis at a time. We should be able to, as the Americans, we like to say, walk and chew gum at the same time. We should be able to say, it's not just Ukraine. It's not just isolated to this. This is an example of the broader, broader attitude and aptitude of Russia to want to control this. Um, people should stop assuming that Russia is just going to be defeated and they'll go away and we don't have to worry about them anymore. Um, I like to use the words force reconstitution in a military sense, but I, I, I would love to see this uh, failure of this Russian regime, but I'm not that optimistic that the people of Russia uh, have have substantially less desires than Vladimir Putin. And in that regard, the Western Balkans to me are still extremely fragile. And there are Russians who still have designs on the future of those countries. And that has to be stopped. I'm going to leave it at that because I want to leave enough time for questions and the like. And I just wanted an opportunity. And thank you, Sasha, for this opportunity to comment on this. Thank you, Deborah. Um... I forgot to introduce uh, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Department of Defense, a senior advisor. Actually, I have to read this out because it's too complicated. Senior Director for the European, Russian, and Eurasian Security Issues, Special Advisor for Strategic and Nuclear Policy for Europe, Senior Advisor to US and NATO military officials. Uh, Deborah led the negotiations for the highly enriched uranium agreement with Russia and headed coalition operations for Iraq and Afghanistan. So, okay, we really have an expert here. I don't want us to lose momentum in time, and I would like to see if you guys have any questions. I think there is already one. Okay, let's let's take a two questions at a time so we get more dynamic. Okay, can I? Can I? You, yes. Okay, so the question, I don't know if our friends at Zoom could hear it. Could you, could we get the microphone to the, yeah, well, okay. So what was the second question over there, please? Okay. So that our, our friends in Washington can hear. Open it up complicated. Uh, does Russia fear Western expansion today and in the future? All right, guys. So we have a question to, uh, uh, on. I think I will just say on a Bosnia-Herzegovina, look, I, I don't think we can anticipate the outcome of, uh, of uh, elections in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Margarita, maybe you, 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 anybody wants to say something, but I think we have a pretty much same old uh, political scene in, in a country. And I think the, the, that, that is going to remain uh, the Bosniak main party will be in a, uh, and then which other will be in a coalition and the Serbians party are going to be there, H disease, recreation, I don't want to be there. I think the key from Bosnia and Herzegovina is overdue, Margarita called it constitutional reform, and I would tend to agree because if you, but not a constitutional reform based on a political desires, this is what brought the trouble. But the constitutional reform based on rule of law, based on the verdicts by the courts, what the courts, we need to really implement what we preach. 
that we are all for the rule of law. I think this is the key. We, if we need to get the internationals, experts, genuine, not to think tankers, not the politicians, but the legal experts on electoral law who will put this complicated uh, map in a question. I think that will change the political scene uh, in the country. Now, that's the first question. Russia, uh, what's the, what would be the Russia? You said, does Russia fear West? Okay. Uh, Let's go, Debra, Ambassador John, Margarita, and then we'll ask Nevoisha and Petra. I believe Russia has done a fabulous job at creating a narrative that everything it does is because of everything the West has done to it. And it reminds me of what um, a three-year-old likes to say to his parents, it's not my fault, you made me do this. And, and I have to say that that's a lot like how Vladimir Putin sounds these days. And unfortunately, he has what I like to call his cacophony of parrots in the West, in Europe, and in the United States, who continually write articles and talk about how, had NATO not enlarged, Vladimir Putin wouldn't have done this. Had the EU not brought these countries in, Vladimir Putin wouldn't have done this. You know, this is just ridiculous. It is an argument without a shred of truth to it. Um, Russia has, as so many of our speakers said, including the minister at the outset, it has always had these imperialist designs. If this has not changed over the years, and it is unbelievable to me that so many in the West have bought into this false Russian narrative as if you just hadn't done this, I wouldn't have had to kill and slaughter and commit genocide against so many people. And so I'll leave it at that. John? I'll agree with Deborah, but with a slightly softer take. Um, it's possible that there are people in Russia who do fear NATO's expansion. It's also true that if NATO had not expanded as it has, the Russian invasions of Georgia and Ukraine might have already been followed by invasions of the Baltic states and of Poland. Uh, Deborah's absolutely right that the West, I uh, shouldn't say the West, enough people in the West seem to accept the Russian notion that they have the right to control all the nations and peoples they controlled up until 1990. As if somehow they are excluded from the history that saw the end of empires the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, where central powers far away were ruling many other nations and other peoples. I don't get why Moscow gets to have full security and its neighbors have zero security. And if we believe that all the neighbors, the small, smaller neighbors of Russia, have a right to security as much as Moscow, this conversation would not be taking place. Good point. Um, Great. Uh, Margarita. Can I can I say uh, just very quick comment? I think the leadership of Russia does not fear the West. If they feared the West, they would not have invaded Ukraine. I think our response and our message was a little too diplomatic and too soft. For months and years, we did not react uh, strongly enough after Georgia. We did not react strongly enough to, after Crimea. And I think that uh, Putin perceived this as weakness. And he perceives, if he perceives the Western leaders as weak, he does what he wants to do. What he did not expect though, was the solidarity of the Western countries in Europe, the United States, Australia, Canada, and Eastern European states in particular, to take the brunt of this war, accept so many refugees, send so many weapons, and help Ukraine. This is absolutely unexpected for, for, for Putin, and I think from now on he may start fearing the West a little bit more. Very, very quick point, uh, Petar, as well. Uh, Professor Popovich, you will give your uh, commentary later on, but let's give a dynamic uh, further questions and the discussions. Nebojša, 15 seconds. Uh, I think that is just excuse for attack uh, Ukraine. It's, uh, he will attack Ukraine without that fear. So that's my 15 seconds <laughs> answer. Very good, Peter. Yes. Here. Yeah. Uh, well, um, 
Well, I agree with, with the uh, commentators before that uh, it's, it's, it's the issue of the perception. I mean, the fear of uh, NATO enlargement is real in Russia, as well as uh, uh, the fact that they do not fear the West. Uh, that's why they did attack. What, um, what actually is perplexing me, and this is something that uh, has awaited this, um, uh, this discussion uh, from the beginning, uh, one part of the puzzle we didn't discuss so far, that is China, uh, also an important player in the Western Balkans. And uh, regarding your question about the expansion of NATO and as a cause of the war in Ukraine, this is something that uh, I think we should be wondering. It, it goes beyond the question of just uh, the war in Ukraine, and that is, how come that there are no red lines when it comes to South China Sea and, uh, and Taiwan? I mean, there are, but not to, to lead to war. And the fact that um, uh, China is deeply integrated into the system, Russia is not. Why? The reason being war, obviously, because if you're not integrated into the system, um, the only way you fight your way uh, for, for your interest is through traditional military means, uh, slaughter, killing cities and people. Um, this is something I think we should be thinking about. All right. Can uh, any question from the audience further? Okay. Let's just get the microphone. Could you please, Nebuisha, thank you so much. Open it up. Uh, hello. My name is Janko Bekic. I work for the Ministry of Defense here in Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, my question is very concrete, um, not general. So, whoever feels the, the need to answer, I would appreciate it. Uh, what do you think or what do you expect might happen if in the elections in Bosnia at the, at the end of this year, Komšić is elected once again against the wishes of the Croats who live <clears throat> and vote in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina? Do you think that this uh, might lead to further destabilization uh, in Bosnia? Uh, in worst case scenario, maybe a new kind of, of conflict. And what kind of message is the European Union sending and other actors in the West who say, even though there has not been electoral reform, we should continue with, with, the, with the elections. Is this a good or a bad message? Thank you. Okay. Uh, valid question. Other questions, we'll take them all at once. Please, let's... Hello? Okay. okay, guys, one very big question here. Do you know why Russia invited Ukraine? Because Putin was thinking that he has vest in his pocket. London for 20 years, London, $30 billion every month of Russian money. Germany paid every month four to five billion dollars for Russian gas. Based on that, he was thinking he has a vest in his pocket. His soft power in Balkans is huge. The major agent of the Russian power in Balkans is a Serbian church. He bought a uh, football fans in Belgrade. He conducting them. Tomorrow morning, if he decide that Delhi of Zvezda or Grobari of Partizan do something against Vucic, he can do it easily. All of that is known to the intelligence services of the West. Nobody did nothing. The minister, foreign affairs minister of this country talk about, you know, against Russia, sanctions and so on. This country did nothing to stop Russian interest in this country. PPD, company that 10 years ago had a 50,000 kunas turnover, today have a 500 million euros turnover because they're importing Russian gas. What this country did to stop those interests in this country? Nothing. These media in this country, public media, are full of Russian agents, paid or unpaid, useful idiot or not idiot, doesn't matter. Going back to Montenegro, because it's very important. Foreign Affairs Minister of Montenegro was a KGB agent for many years. He is now advisor of President Jukanovic, sitting on the meetings in NATO Pact. Milan Rochen, everybody knows that, it's a joke. You know, we are, we are all joking about that. He's sitting on the meetings and passing the messages to Moscow, whatever NATO decide. You know, five years ago in Sutomor, a beautiful beach in Montenegro, there was, a, there was a plate, you know, only for Russian kids. 
Who brought Russians to Montenegro? Milo Djukanovic. He made a deal with Aluminium Cominant, you know. He made a deal for Ponto Montenegro with Deripaska, knowing that Deripaska is the right-hand guy of Putin. This is the question that needs to be addressed. So what was the, the question? Big hypocrisy, big hypocrisy of the West. The West hypocrisy except, from the West. Except United That's States of America, which was clear from the beginning to the end. But the West, European Union, need to deal with themselves regarding the Putin. May, can you just introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Ratko Gnezic. I have a diplomacy and business background. And, you know, I'm commenting sometimes on my Facebook and then Index and National taking that and publishing. But all these questions need to be addressed. This Indeed. is the real core. Very, that's, that's brilliant. This is the real core of the... It sorry if I interrupted. Okay, let's, let's get one more question and there. Uh, our... our panelists are already, I guess, making some points. Um, John, Deborah, Margarita, I touch also about the China. I think Professor Petter did mention so very well. I think we've there is now different uh, alliance emerging uh, between Russia, China, and Southeast Asia. Not a part of the discussion of Western Balkans, but I think in a second should be addressed. Okay, another question. So, hello everyone. Uh, Vyacheslav Ross, Faculty of Political Science, University of Zagreb. So, let's go back to Bosnia, just for a second. Um, could someone uh, from the panel actually address the issue of um, lack of quality communication between the U.S. Embassy in Sarajevo and the Office of the High Representative? We know from the past, we know from Schwarzschilling, that a lot of the things that the West wanted to do in Bosnia were actually prevented by Brussels and Washington not being on the same page, not really having the same goals and not really seeing the information from the same angle. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we have a question on... Uh, election of uh, Komšić by the uh, not only Croatian votes and its electoral reform in the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, but being elected also by the Bosniak um, um, uh, votes. It's a, it's a startling uh, question that has been uh, going in the country for uh, last decades. We have uh, issue of uh, this communication, and I think this is very specific that we can ask our panelists, and I can only tell you, I think that the, the, the United States is, it has worked closely, as I know, um, uh, with the Brussels and in, in, in what we had as a think tankers discussions back in the day. Um, we've, we've, we've discussed the notion uh, uh, on, a, let's say, sanctions on a Dodik, who um, is a best friend to Putin and who is a uh, big elephant in a room, not the only elephant in the room, but is a big elephant in the room. And um, we, I argue that unless, and we, the, the, the colleagues, we all argue that unless you have a European Union and Brussels engaging in the same sanctions that OFEC does in the US Department of Treasury, the effect of, 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 of a blacklisting an individual uh, would not have a deep um, effect even not in a local uh, politics okay but uh, we will we will come to that um deborah john john if, if i can answer first because i have to get off in one minute i've okay. got a meeting on uh, which i have to start i have to start on time at 10 30 at 12 30. i'll just address the china question um it's true that the western response to chinese aggression in the south china sea the island building the attacks on other nation ships as China's trying to establish its territorial quote unquote waters um, has been less than the response in Ukraine. But then that's because the provocation while severe is significantly less than the war that Moscow has been waging on Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea going back to 2014. But I see a clear connection between the rest grow, growing strong response in Ukraine and China's activities, especially vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, but perhaps also more broadly in the South China Sea. I think the Chinese are uh, cautioned by the un unexpectedly strong Western response to the, to the Putin aggression in Ukraine. You know, all the things that's happened with NATO, including now the desire of Finland and Sweden to join, but also, well, I would call it the not strong enough, still not weak response uh, to in Ukraine with Western supply of weapons and placing down of serious sanctions on the Kremlin. Uh, I think that Ma China's calculations probably changed towards more caution as a result. But I would hope once, once Putin is clearly defeated in Ukraine, we pay more quality 
and more um, and stronger attention to China. Uh, anyway, with that, I have to run to my next event. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us, John. God bless. Deborah, Margarita, would you have any comments on the questions? Yeah, um, a, a little bit further on China. Um, this goes back to the heart of what I was saying earlier, which is that the United States is a superpower and the supposed leader of the democratic free world. And there's been a lot said that if the United States pays attention to Europe, it cannot pay attention to the Pacific. And if that's the case, why has the US taxpayer invested so heavily into this military and democratic might that this country has uh, economically, militarily, and otherwise? And so I would argue that you can do two things at once. One of the examples on China is for 12 years, going back to the George W. Bush administration, going through the Obama administration and into the Trump administration, the United States did not do a single freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. In other words, that message conveyed to China that it was free to do whatever it wanted in the South China Sea, including building you know, aircraft uh, landing fields out of sandbars in that sea, intimidate Vietnam over water, intimidate other countries, not just in the South China Sea, but elsewhere. And when you disappear from an area, someone is going to fill that void. And that someone is usually going to be Russia or China, and their designs on that area are never going to be quite as nice as those exhibited by the West. So that's the first thing. The second thing is China's approach to places like Taiwan and Hong Kong. And for Hong Kong, it wants to turn Hong Kong into the, the Wall Street of China. China does tends not to destroy, it tends to absorb. Uh, for Taiwan, they would like to turn Taiwan into the Silicon Valley of China. So massive destruction of those places by China would not lead to China's greater goals of integration and, and, and helping build this huge Chinese economic empire. Russia's approach tends to be aggressive and destruction. China's approach tends to be absorption. Um, and so I just wanted to say that the question on China is a good one because they, they, they use money and economic influence on their Belt and Road Initiative to force countries to turn over property at because they know that they'll never be able to pay back those loans at the terms the Chinese have done. They've done this in Ethiopia. Uh, they've done it in Israel with port facilities, and they'll continue to do it in the Balkans and elsewhere as long as countries continue to turn a blind eye to what the repayment of those loans actually costs. And what they usually cost is turning over substantial amounts of geography usually related to a huge uh, economic part of that, those countries' economies. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, yeah, uh, talking about China uh, and China and the Balkans in particular, there is a really big difference between uh, what uh, Russia and China are doing and what they're pursuing in the region. They pursue different goals and they have different motivations. Russian influence aims to destabilize the region, prevent settlement of conflicts and derail mem membership in the Western, in Western blocs. At the same time, China is seeking to achieve economic importance and political clout in countries that are not yet in the European Union in order to benefit when they join the European Union. Thus, Chinese investments are not necessarily aimed to destabilize the region but predatory lending and debt traps are real danger and involving the European Commission in every attempt of China to invest uh, in the region is really important because that could, re could mitigate the problem. Chinese investments, although often critical uh, for Serbia, for example, and other countries in the region, are still much smaller than the EU investments um, and volume of trade. They're only 1% in Serbia, although the Serbian public perceives China as it's, it's the biggest donor of the country. While attention is needed to, uh, to all deals with China, 
they do not appear to be as toxic as Russian investment in influence uh, uh, in the Western Balkans. But uh, in terms of Russian influence also uh, to respond to the question about Montenegro and Deripaska's investment in alumina plant, that was one subversive tool, but it failed. Uh, the, to, uh, the Montenegro government eventually revoked the deal and tried to fix the problem. Of course, it has consequences of, of such mistake. But Russia miscalculated with that investment. It miscalculated with the uh, staged of uh, staged coup d'état um, in 2016. It must it's miscalculated in Macedonia when it uh, funded uh, sports clubs to storm the parliament and beat up uh, Albanian and other members of parliament there. They could not stop the accession of Montenegro to NATO. That was the purpose of the coup d'etat. They could not stop, stop the accession of Macedonia to, uh, to NATO. That was the purpose of uh, all these protests in Greece and, and Macedonia that were funded by Russian money. Um, so uh, th there are certain mistakes that were made in the region. One of them, I will say, is outright was the uh, allowing Luke Oil to buy the only refinery in Bulgaria that supplies with gasoline right now the entire Balkan region. Um, so it, back in um, in late 90s, there were no other investors. There was no other interest in the Balkans. And this is what uh, uh, the countries in the Balkans need to do now. Fix the rule of law and, and deal with corruption, deal with transparency, provide more transparency and accountability to attract healthy investments and not be uh, prey to Chinese or Russian investments as Montenegro is at the moment with China, this big highway that was supposed to be built and uh, Montenegro cannot pay the loan now because because it's a huge loan with huge interest uh, to China, a typical uh, debt trap that was uh, that that happened uh, in um, in Montenegro. Miscalculation of Russia, but also um, uh, protection of this, our societies from unhealthy, unhealthy investments. Thank you, Margarita. I think I will answer the uh, uh, advisor to a uh, defense minister question, and uh, maybe I actually should. Uh, I agree with you. I think it's a problem, uh, but I also agree that the problems in Bosnia and Herzegovina started to go from April package back then that was uh, brokered and unfortunately failed. Um, by two votes short to a Bosniak uh, Selajic party uh, uh, rejection at the time. I think everybody now realized that document was a huge step forward for a country. As I mentioned at the beginning, you had, um, everybody knows without solving the European courts rulings, you can't enter European Union. And if we do preach the rule of law, as just Margarita greatly emphasized, then the local court decision needs to be addressed. And I think the political narrative in Bosnia and Herzegovina has went to some universe space as little to do with people. That's why people and families, young people, and not just young people and families, they're leaving country because of the very same old, same old, same old. And here is a proposition and to the solution. This is not just based on what the Dayton Peace Accord is. You're correct. Croatia is a member of European Union. And I think, again, not from the political perspective, but from the legal perspective, perhaps Croatia can launch the uh, project with the Venetia Commission, with the prominent electoral law experts internationally who will look into the complexities of Bosnia and Herzegovina and come up with a solution that will include balanced and optimum democratic nature of Bosnia and Herzegovina to protect its citizens, its minorities, and its constituencies. And how that will be done, I'm not an expert. This is just only a sound. Um, logical uh, uh, suggestion. And I would leave it at that. I think this could be, this is the, this is the key. Nobody has, for various reasons in Bosnia and Herzegovina, 
for keeping the status quo, those who are boosting themselves as the big patriots of the country, and those who are then labeled as uh, Russian agents or uh, obstructionists or separatists, or it's a uh, it's, it's it's also an issue that has to be addressed in Bosnia. But I think it cannot be addressed whether I like or dislike or who is my partner or not and how we like it locally. But I think it has to be addressed for the benefit of a people literally by walking the line of the rule of law, the verdicts that were done and what they mean and how to be implemented. Does it mean that the presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina has to have five members as it had back in the day once time? Not a new to the country. Does that mean what is the ratio, 33, 33, 33% of Serb, Croats, Bosniaks in a government? How many, how much percentage is for the others? How much percentage is for the citizens? How can you protect Croatian national rights so that the Croats living either in Bosnia or Herzegovina, anywhere in the territory, will vote their own representative? What is the impact of that representative? Is it just a symbolic member of a member of a presidency or is it deeper? I really pray that this country stops living in this a bubble. The economy is progressing. It's a beautiful country. People, there is room for everyone. But I think the 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 the, the, the courts identified the discriminations back then. That Holbrook, who was a very good friend and and a mentor, couldn't think about because everybody know what happened in the 90s and how brutal that it was. So the key was just to stop the war and make balance that, that, will, that everybody will accept. So that's my proposition how to move forward so that even after maybe 15 years of procrastination, that there could be at least a tangible proposition that could make sense so that the people can punish those who will not, those politicians who will not adhere to say, hey, this is the way we can live all together all in peace and harmony. Peter, you have a last word. I don't know if there is any question. We really having run. Okay, one more, really, but really run. And I'm, I want to say, bliss of a bliss of a second. I don't want to be. There's so many bright young students here. I say I, I want to give you an opportunity. So go ahead. Uh, I have just one brief question. Uh, what is your take on a Serbian role concept? Uh, in terms of security in the Balkans and it being an extension to the Russian world? I'll give the Margarita she, uh, that question. Very, very excellent question. Another one more. Let's let's engage with our students here. So, uh, Jeremy Truitt. Yes. So I have a question to uh, Professor Margarita. Uh, from her speech, I conclude that she says something like uh, that we need to um, reform Dayton and to erase this constituency of people. Uh, so we know that this kind of uh, the democracy that is in Bosnia is in uh, post-conflict and deeply divided societies. And we have it in uh, Northern Ireland and in South Europe. So uh, some kind of liberal liberalization of this uh, democracy happened in early 2000. So what is her suggestion? Uh, how to change this type of democracy to more uh, liberal majority democracy and to remain uh, uh, or to get to the uh, stable uh, country there and um, to, to not have a cyber scenario. All right, Margarita, you have two questions. Deborah, I'll ask you for your quick closing remark after Margarita says so, if you have any, and then Petar, and then we're done. Uh, thank you. I think the Serbian world concept is as dangerous as the Russian world concept. Uh, it can morph into something that is very, very uh, unsavory and dangerous for, for the Balkans. It is a multi-ethnic societies. Even looking at the Serbian society, there's so many Albanians living in the Preševo Valley area. Um, there are other nationalities living there. It's not possible to claim that there could be a Serbian world because that means threatening other territories. This can lead 
to uh, aspirations to annex, to partition the Balkans, to partition the, the uh, partition Kosovo, partition Macedonia, partition Bosnia, uh, and pretty much unite Serbian territories. But once the Serbian territories start uniting, you're opening another possibility of Albanian territories becoming united as well. One feeds to the other. Serbian worlds feeds into uh, the, uh, the opposite action of Albanian world. Do we want to do that? It's really extremely dangerous concept can lead to, to war and conflict for years to come. This needs to be addressed uh, as soon as possible by the societies in the Balkans and by the European Union and uh, also very firmly by the United States as well, uh, because it cannot, it, it cannot continue. In the light of what we're seeing in Ukraine, it's just not possible to, to continue that. In terms of Bosnia, there is a lot of thought that needs to be put into a new constitution to make the Bosnian um, society a modern democracy representative for all ethnic uh, groups as well, uh, but not prevent, for example, a Jewish president to be ever elected in the society. I think this needs to be done with the help of the civil society that, uh, and, uh, that need to Im Im impact political parties and push for uh, provisions that are going to benefit every single citizen of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. We can no longer live in divided societies. Serbs and Bosnians and Croats, and uh, despite the legacy of the war, there, there needs to be something better that inspire people rather than sticking to their ethnic kingship. Uh, and this is uh, the democratic values, the prosperity, the, the uh, joining the uh, European Union, having the freedoms to, to travel and work in other countries, and at the same time, having uh, the freedom of investment uh, that is coming to, to the country because it feels secure, it feels uh, ethnic divisions are not going to cause another conflict and um, ethnic conflict is not going to make them leave the, the country one day. And I think this is up to the Bosnian people and I think civil society needs to address this. This is their task, very, very important task. Thank you, Margarita. Debra, anything you want to add? I'm going to say in closing that um, thank you for this opportunity. And I want to say something to all the young people who are here today and the students in particular. You are the future. You get to define this better than we have. You get to do things that will make your future better instead of hanging on to the tired old arguments and fighting. We cannot allow ourselves to be defined by small ethnic definitions of who we are. We should be able to define for ourselves who we are and what we want for our futures and our future democracy. And it's up to you, you young people, to understand that. And we should never ever tolerate outside countries coming in to tell us and define for us what they're going to do. This is what Russia tried to do in the Baltics. This is what Russia tried to do with its so-called Russian speakers in Ukraine. And if we allow that to happen, none of us will be happy with the outcome. We know what that is. So what I would do is urge all of you to move past these stubborn hundreds year old definitions that have, have made us stultified countries and nations subject to outside influence. The way to get rid of this is to not let others define who we are. We define who we are. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah. Now, Professor Popovich, no pressure. You have a few minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, always a pleasure to be a commentator. You cannot uh, really enjoy the talking <laughs> and giving um, full, fully being involved in the discussion. So, um, just to sum up, this is uh, this was actually uh, our meeting here today was motivated by the book. Uh, written by uh, our colleague, uh, Mr. Todorovic. Uh, the book, The uh, Russian uh, Policy Towards uh, Western Balkans. Um, funny thing is the book was written two years ago uh, and we are only promoting it today because in between was a COVID pandemic, but then came the war in Ukraine and a lot has changed. But as yet, uh, the much we discussed here there are themes that are uh, uh, recurring and uh, 
which are in a, in a constant regarding the policy of Russia towards Western Balkans. So just to sum up of what we've heard here and uh, to leave you thinking about some stuff that I was thinking about while listening to, the, uh, uh, to our presentations. So what we heard today, I think we can divide in two dimensions of uh, looking at uh, Russia's policy in general and towards uh, uh, Western Balkans in particular. The one is the concrete material uh, empirical uh, policy of hybrid warfare. We see it with um, uh, corruption in defense industry, in, in the uh, me with media outlets, the propaganda, uh, and everything that was mentioned, uh, which in details our, our uh, distinguished guests um, explained, especially the role of the Orthodox Church, and not to mention, above all, the energy sector. So this is something that, um, as was uh, mentioned, is the pol policy of vacuum. The, 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 it, when, when democracies are in retreat, when, when the West is in retreat, Russia is just filling the vacuum in. There is no problem there. When it comes to values, when it comes to rule of law, when it comes to these um, I, uh, ideas, norms, values, something that's not concrete. Uh, that's true, Russia is living in an alternative universe when it comes to values. But the problem with the West, I believe, is how to translate values into uh, concrete policy and not to get uh, uh, on bumpy road when it comes to reality. I, for, for one thing is um, uh, what the... Um, what was mentioned is the that the war in Ukraine has united uh, the West, and this is the. It was mentioned a few times that uh, this is the unique opportunity to get Western Balkans moving faster towards European Union. Uh, there are contradictions and ambiguities regarding this policy for decades, and I don't think that uh, this is something that goes beyond the war in Ukraine. Um, and. Um, one example. It was mentioned in our discussion, the so-called Serbian world. It is only one dimension modeled after the Russian world, the Roski Mir, right? It is, um, it is a, just a political dimension of what already is taking place, and that is a hegemonic unification on a free trade area called, formally known as Mini Schengen. Schengen being only in name, of course, because the uh, there is uh, Serbia will never uh, recognize Kosovo uh, and how can you have a free trade area where there is a blockage of free movement of people, goods and services uh, for as long as they have certificates of paper from Kosovo right, that Serbia is going to block so um, uh, because each country of the Western Balkans should be assessed individually politically, how it made the progress. Um, and that would be a right thing to do. Uh, that's not being made because of these uh, initiatives that was uh, taken um, as, um, as, as a uh, European Union's mantra uh, that uh, um, mar uh, rationality of market cures always the irrationality of politics. This is this liberal idealism we're living in. This is, this is where these norms and values uh, might fog the, 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 the concrete strategy and pragmatism of how to deal with the Western Balkans. That's the way I feel it. And um, well, I would leave it here at that. And uh, <coughs> thank you very much. Thank you. I think you brought a very good comment at the end. There is uh, more deeper discussions than required on the best way forward with the best of bankers. I want to thank you all for being uh, here with us, our great panelists and friends in uh, Washington, D.C. Thank you so much, Minister uh, of Foreign European Affairs of Croatia, and above all, the University of Libertas. It has been really a pleasure to be in this uh, private university, so magnificent place, and to feel you all here. And I look forward to next time around. God bless you all. And uh, until next time around. <laughs>